This is the 15th in a series of lectures on differential geometry. In the last lecture, we looked at quotients of Lie groups. We're going to continue with that today, thinking about some examples of co quotienting, Lie by, um, quotienting manifolds by Lie group actions. And then we're going to think about homogeneous spaces, the simplest kind of Lie group actions. Our, in our previous lecture, we saw that uh, the uh, incidence correspondence of a group action, of a Lie group action, is an embedded submanifold, closed embedded submanifold, if and only if the uh, the action has uh, has um, the quotient space. It's a smooth manifold with a smooth submersion down to that quotient space by the quotient map. Let's consider a simple example of actually checking to see that something is act as a smooth manifold quotient. We can take, as usual, k to be uh, r, c, or h. And we'll consider some kind of a map. Um, just for simplicity, let's look at the map phi of x and y is uh, one quarter. I think I want something like that. A uh, quarter uh, x uh, plus uh, y squared, and then y over 2. So that map will squeeze, at least if x and y are small enough, it'll simply sort of squeeze them in toward the origin. And I'll let you prove that uh, that this map actually um, is um, is uh, one to one and has no fixed points. Um, uh, it's a it's a diffeomorphism uh, away from the origin and with no fixed points. So um, so what we're going to do is to quotient by the map in the sense that we'll let uh, we'll let the manifold be uh, k two minus the origin. And then we'll let the group be the group generated by that map phi. In other words, it's the the set of all compositions of phi j times. I'll write phi j for the j-fold composition of phi um, carried out j times such that uh, j is in the integer, so allowing positive, negative, and zero powers of this phi. Um, and we want to see that there is a quotient. Um, that there's a quotient. It's a smooth manifold. Um, so we're going to have this R, the incidence correspondence. That's the set of uh, x and gx, such that x is in M and g is in G. That's the definition in general for incidence correspondence. In this particular problem, that means that that's the x and the phi j of x. Remember, that's j-fold composition, um, such that x is in k2 minus the origin, so it's a non-origin point at this plane, and then um, j is an integer. So that's the incidence correspondence. Now it's natural to think of it as a union of uh, over j of, let's say, rj, where each rj is the incidence just for the particular group element, vj of x, such that x is in k2 minus the origin. So in this situation, I've fixed the value of j. Here I allowed all possible j's. Here I'm just allowing one particular j. And then r uh, is the union of these, uh, the union over j of the rj's. And it's actually a disjoint union, um, which is easy to check because there's no fixed points. Um, they, they keep moving to different places depending on the j. And so there's no way to make those overlap. The problem is uh, really uh, that if we think about it as having with these rj's, which are easily, trivially seen to be embedded submanifolds, they're just graphs of functions, so they're obviously embedded submanifolds. The rj's containing m cross m are embedded. Um, just the graph of some map. Um, but uh, they're embedded submanifolds. But then what about their union? r is the union of them. Uh, well, I need to make sure that not only that they don't overlap, but that there isn't one of them that approaches another one. Um, as you slide along this one, you hit into that one. Is, could that sort of thing happen? Um, so we have to be a bit careful about that. But that turns out not to be a real problem. Um, suppose that we have some xi, some yi in R uh, convergence, uh, convergent sequence, where there's some xy in R. Um, well, let's say to first some x, y, and m cross m. I want to show that it's in R and that it 
uh, and that we can also keep these sort of behaviors from happening. So I won't give all the details. Um, but uh, to be in R means these have to be of the form xi and phi ji of xi, something like that. Um, and that has to converge to some x and y. Um, uh, so that means that the um, the xi have to converge to the x, and the phi ji of xi's have to converge to y, and y has to be non zero. Um, now, if we make these uh, if we make these get very very large, I won't prove it, but they should they would actually contract toward the origin. So if we make xi very close to x, then phi ji of xi will become very very close to zero, which I won't prove. Um, so uh, unless ji is bounded, so we need uh, j the sequence of the ji's to be sequence j sub i's to be bounded, or else this thing can't approach a non-zero limit um, because it gets contracted in. I won't um, prove that it either gets contracted in or flies out. If it has uh, large positive j's, it gets contracted into the origin. If it's large negative j's, it gets pulled away from the origin out to infinity. And so I won't prove that. Um, so, but if one, once we have these uh, bounded sequence of integers, we can, without loss of generality, we can take an infinite um, uh, subsequence and, and make them constant. And so they all stay the same rj. So then the xi, yi, whole sequence is in a single rj, which is closed, uh, and a closed embedded submanifold. And so the limit is in the same rj, which is, uh, which is contained in r. Um, so R is closed, but not only that. Uh, if you're on um, if you're on these R J's and you approach along one of them another one, then they have to be the same one, um, and it's an embedded submanifold. So you don't have this kind of picture happening. So I'm not going to give more detail. I'll just say that from this, it's not hard to convince yourself that R is an embedded closed submanifold. Uh, submanifold, and therefore that the hop vibration is actually smooth. So, roughly speaking, we have a picture that's something like, um, let's say, we have a picture that looks something like uh, some kind of smooth. Uh, well, we have some vector space. We have some kind of smooth objects which are being uh, squeezed into one another. This phi map is squeezing this to this, and this to this, and so on and so forth. So they're gluing together. So if you cut out the strip in between these two regions, uh, one of them being some maybe, some, maybe some large sphere, then the other one being phi applied to that large sphere. You cut out the region in between and glue the two boundaries, then you get the Hopf manifold. There's not a very exciting manifold. In the case of the real numbers, it only gives us just a torus. Um, but it does give us a serious example, and the, with the complex numbers, for example, or the quaternions, gives a serious example of a, of a, of a manifold um, that uh, that comes up by quotienting by some kind of nonlinear transformation. And so the beginning of, of studying the relationship between, they say, the topology of, the, of these gluings together by a dynamical system and, uh, and the, the structure of the dynamical system. Now, um, another type of example um, is one where we might actually know of an explicit uh, case of a submersion. Um, so we already have uh, in hand a submersion. Uh, some p phi takes p to q mapping, and suppose it happens to be the case that um, that uh, suppose we have also a, a group, a Lie group action. G Lie group G acting on p. And suppose that the uh, that phi is constant on the uh, orbits of g of the g action, and then uh, so we have this p and we have these g orbits um, going up and down inside p, and then uh, we have some sort of quotient space. Um, so q. So here's p. Here's q. The orbits turn out to be exactly. The um, the orbit, so it's constant. The orbits and uh, different orbits, different g orbits, map to different points. Uh, 
then in fact, uh, I'm not going to prove it, so this is something of a, of a theorem, um, then uh, in fact Q is uh, diffeomorphic, naturally, canonically diffeomorphic to the quotient G mod P. Um, it is the quotient. And, and that's important because often we do have examples in hand of submersions. We have them uh, invariant under some Lie group action and uh, just different orbits going to different places. So we can actually explicitly give this submersion because we, we proved by our theorem that there is ex an abstract, maybe some abstract quotient, but we want to show that this really is the quotient. And if we have it already in hand, we already know what it is, um, then that can be helpful. We don't have to waste time worrying about calculating the incidence correspondence, and we can just see the answer. Um, so I'll leave you to um, to uh, prove um, to prove this result. Um, uh, I won't worry about proving it. It's not difficult. Nice exercise. And um, let's just look at an example of applying it. Um, so if we had a um, if we had as an example um, take P to be the sphere of some odd of some odd um, dimension, um, which we can think of as the unit sphere inside R two n plus two, but I want to identify that with a complex number C n plus one. Then um, we could try to map um, each point of that sphere to some uh, by some group action. Um, we could let Q be the complex projective space of dimension n, which remember is the set of complex lines through uh, the origin in Cn plus 1. So um, P consists of the unit vectors or the units, uh, around the unit sphere in this complex vector space. Um, and so we can map pi takes P to Q um, by pi of z equals the line through 0 and z. Um, and that gives us a map from uh, points of the sphere, unit sphere, because none of those points are 0. There's a unique one line between any, point, any two points, so 0 and z. So as long as z's not 0, that's a unique line, such line. We've already checked this a smooth map. Um, and so, uh, so this map then should be the uh, the quotient map for some group action. What's the group? The group G is just going to be uh, the unit uh, complex number sitting in the complex plane. In the compl among the complex numbers, we take the ones of unit length, and they form a circle. Right in the, in the complex numbers, we have the circle of unit length complex numbers. That's our group. And what we can do, of course, is to take any uh, unit vector. Um, so it's a unit. Uh, it's it's a vector. Uh, of complex numbers, uh, z1 to z, uh, well, z0 to zn is maybe the best way to do it. Um, and we're just acting on it by e to the i theta z, right? z goes to e to the i theta z, where the e to the i theta is a complex number, so unit complex numbers, it's, that's our group acting. It's rescaling this unit vector by this unit complex number. And it's not hard to convince yourself that uh, that 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 way, if z is on some complex line, you go through all the unit vectors on that complex line. That you have a somehow you have a, a complex line, and in some huge dimensional uh, c n plus one, well, it should go through the origin, I suppose. So you have this complex line, and then what you do is just take any unit vector z on it, and then spin it around the unit circle around the origin. By, by this action here, and so it's not too surprising that the quotient should actually be uh, B C P N, and and that's a result of that that exercise that theorem I just wrote that P quotiented by G is exactly identified with canonically identified with C P N, which is this Q, and the reason is that we have a submersion. We wrote one down. Um, we've already checked in in our charts. This is a submersion, and it does have the right property that that the preimage of any point consists of all the unit vectors on that complex line, and those are exactly the vectors you get by multiplying by e to the i theta. So this actually must be uh, a diffeomorphism. Okay. So that's that's a useful fact, because it's not completely obvious. Just because we have a, an explicitly written quotient map doesn't mean that that is the quotient map of the group action. It needs a bit of checking.
So now we want to start on a, on a different topic entirely, which is to think about homogeneous spaces of, of Lie groups. Um, so we're going to think about um, uh, homogeneous spaces, and we're interested in um, trying to have some sort of rough classification of what they are. And uh, so one way we can start that is the following. Uh, suppose we have a XG, it's a homogeneous space, where that means that X is a manifold, G is a Lie group, G acts on smoothly on X, and the action is transitive. Right? So somehow G takes any point of X to any other point of X by some by some element of G. So that's a homogeneous space. Um, uh, then um, for any uh, point x not in x, the stabilizer, which I'll also give the name h to, uh, that's the stabilizer of that point, the elements that fix that point, uh, is a closed subgroup of G. And that's a triviality because it's defined by the condition that it has to fix this point and that that's a, a, a condition on a, on a continuous map having a particular value, so that means it has to be a closed set, um, so by just by continuity. So that's not very deep. Um, uh, but on the other hand, um, the deeper bit is that you can then take the map G and G. Um, this is also more or less obvious. You map it to GX naught in X. That map... Uh, is clearly well defined and smoothed by the smoothness of the group action. It maps group to homogeneous space, but it maps every element. If G happens to be an H, then we've said by by definition H of the element is the elements that fix X naught. So if something fixes X naught, then it goes to X naught. G X naught is X naught fixes um, X naught. And in particular, if you had anything uh, G H, let's say G is in G H is in H. Uh, this guy would also go to g h x naught is g h x naught is well h fixes x naught so that's just g x naught and so what we find is that g h in in g goes to the same point and so we can write that as saying that g times any element of h maps to uh, g times x naught. In other words, we could say this map, smooth map, perfectly well-defined smooth map, actually descends to a map on the quotient G mod H. In other words, we are here we're right-acting by elements of H, right-acting on, on G by right translations, um, and that means that you end up with elements that look like this with H on the right, and we said that H on the right, when you, when you get that element to act on X naught, the H doesn't do anything. And so this actually is well defined um, to sorry to X, which is given by what it's, it maps G H coset to a G X naught in X, and this is a coset, so it's an element of G mod H. So it means that, in other words, this map so going through all this step, we've taken a smooth map here, and we found that the map becomes well defined as a map on the quotient space. So we started with the map here, and we argued that it actually descends here. Okay, this isn't really a good clear statement of the theorem. I wanted to state a theorem, but um, let's uh, let's now think about what does that mean? Um, here's the, the rest of the theorem. Um, so then um, uh, G mod H is a manifold. Uh, it has a manifold structure. It's a quotient manifold of G, and um, uh, let's say G H as a point of G mod H maps to G X naught in X um, is a G equivariant diffeomorphism. So G equivariant means it, that when you act on G on this side, you get the same result as you act on this side. So you get a map, it's a smooth map, it's a G invariant diffeomorphism. And so as a homogeneous space, we can say that XG is essentially the same homogeneous space as G mod H X, G mod H G. Um, so that's um, that the result in that direction. Um, uh, so uh, conversely, uh, finally, the last bit of this long theorem, uh, if H contained in G is any 
closed subgroup. So what we assumed at the beginning of this discussion was that we had a homogeneous space. Now we've said it, it really is just completely determined by the closed subgroup H. On the other hand, if you have a closed subgroup, um, then uh, then um, X can be defined to be G mod H um, gives X G. So uh, X G is a homogeneous space. So um, so that has, to, has a bit to be proved in it. Um, so what we're saying, though, is, uh, to put it simply, that we have an, 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 uh, a bijection between uh, homogeneous spaces, which are rather abstract objects, right, a group with a special kind of transitive action on the submanifold. Those can be completely determined by closed subgroups. Uh, if you know all the closed subgroups, you know all the homogeneous spaces and vice versa. Um, so that's uh, more or less what we're saying here, that homogeneous spaces are classified by their closed subgroups, so their stabilizer groups, and, and then closed subgroups always come about that way, so that's, that cla completely classifies the homogeneous spaces of any Lie group. So let's see how we prove this momentous result, because this really does help us to understand what are, where are homogeneous spaces coming from. Um, so proof, um, well we already know that H uh, gets closed, uh, then it's automatically embedded uh, because we had that as a very difficult theorem that we proved. Um, our incidence relation, uh, uh, that, for what action though? Remember we're getting to G and we're getting H to act on G on the right by multiplying on the right. The incidence relation is the set of elements G and GH, H acting here, H is doing the acting, it's acting on the right, um, such that G is in G and H is in H. That's actually um, diffeomorphic to G cross H by taking um, each element AB maps to A, A inverse B. Um, that maps um, R to G mod H, and it's a diffeomorphism. In particular, it's actually a closed submanifold. Um, this mapping being globally well defined on G cross G, we can actually see that this map, therefore, is a, is a closed submanifold. And so, therefore, we get that the quotient X is G mod H is actually smooth, a smooth manifold, and that the map G goes to, uh, well, so this is defining for us X, given a closed subgroup, we're defining the homogeneous space, and then this guy is the quotient map, and it's a smooth submersion. Okay, so we've got part of the work done. Um, in fact, also this uh, is also G equivariant because it is, um, after all, the G action. Um, so, um, right, and uh, the action is smooth on, on here because it's smooth on here. Um, because, you know, sorry, it's smooth on here because it's smooth on G. G acting on itself is smooth, so G acting on G mod H is smooth. Now we want to go the other way. Um, suppose that we have a homogeneous space, um, and uh, we let H be the, uh, the stabilizer of some point X naught in capital X. So what we've got then, um, uh, we want to construct our, our map, as we said before, we take G and G and map it to GX naught in X. This is a smooth map from G to X, um, but uh, it's clearly a H invariant, as we pointed out before, so as we said, it descends to a map like this. Okay, so what we need to do then is um, is to figure out why this is actually going to be um, uh, a diffeomorphism. As above, we've said already, we, we can prove that this guy is actually a smooth manifold, that th there we do get this quotient existing, um, so as a, as a manifold. And since this map is smooth, this map is also smooth. So it's a smooth bijection, and I, I won't prove that it's a bijection, you can check that it's a bijection. Um, uh, now we can use a big hammer from topology um, that we have we have a proper um, uh, injection uh, injection sorry a proper injective continuous map injection um, 
uh, to uh, a locally compact. We've actually used this result once before, I should say. Um, Hausdorff uh, space um, is uh, homeomorphism to its image. So it's not a very um, it's not it's not maybe a result that you're very familiar with, but um, but it is proven in some topology textbooks. So uh, we don't want to give a proof of that because it's very much uh, the wrong flavor of material. It's very much topology. So our our map therefore in this case is uh, a uh, is well this is a is a nice smooth manifold. It's a locally compact Hausdorff space. Uh, this is a proper injection, and so it's a homeomorphism to its image, and so it's actually a homeomorphism. Um, so now we have to make sure that it's actually smooth, but we can check and see what the smooth maps are. Smooth uh, functions on X um, are um, are just exactly the um, uh, they pull back to G under this map we had here exactly to smooth uh, H invariant functions on G, and that's all the same. Um, that's the same as smooth functions on G mod H. And I won't uh, give more detail that. That, I think, hopefully gives you enough detail to be able to recover the, the, the complete proof. Um, so that it says that we get a ma perfect matching up of smooth functions, so the map is, in fact, a diffeomorphism. So let's see uh, how we can apply this. This is a very difficult result. Uh, well, somewhat difficult. It uses a lot of heavy machinery, particularly our use of uh, of these incidence relations, which was our incidence correspondence, which was extremely difficult to uh, to, to work with to prove the the existence of the quotient. Um, what we'd like to do now is to see if we can use this in examples. Um, so let's let um, let's consider the group G, which is G L N K, and we know that it acts transitively. Forget that we know anything about Grassmannians, but it certainly acts transitively on the set. Let's just call it a set. Gr uh, p, let's say gr p uh, k n of p-dimensional subspaces, linear subspaces. So forgetting that the Grassmannian is actually a manifold, going right back to where we started at the beginning of the whole the whole class, we thought about, we proved the swing was a manifold, but now we're just going to treat it as a set, forget that it's a manifold. Um, we can take any p-dimensional linear subspace to any other bilinear transformation, and so this guy acts transitively, these linear transformations. Um, now, um, we can consider the uh, pick one, uh, any, any one, um, so this is, let's call it capital X, and let's let pick any one X naught and X, any p-dimensional linear subspace, and then look at the stabilizer, let's call it H, as we did above, which is GX naught. This is the set of n by n matrices uh, fixing uh, this uh, p-dimensional linear uh, subspace, uh, which we called X naught. And just for simplicity, we can always make it be the set of vectors that have a P of guys being non possibly non-zero and then a whole bunch of zeros, um, N minus P zeros. Um, so if that's our subspace, just to make it simple, um, uh, this group of matrices is what? Which matrices fix that subspace? Well, they're the matrices that, uh, if you think of them as blocks, have to have zeros down here and then anything here, anything here, anything here. Uh, where this is what this is p by p and minus p by n minus p um, and that's clearly a closed subgroup because it's cut out by the condition that these vanish these being zero is exactly the condition or if you like is to cut out that by the condition that this linear subspace is invariant um, but anyway it's clearly that it's clear by this linear algebra it has the matrices with which have this being zero and so it's closed because if you have a sequence of matrices with zeros down here, the limit has zeros down here. So it's a closed subgroup. And so we have H is a closed subgroup, and therefore X, which we define to be, uh, well, the Grassmannian, um, 
uh, but it's clearly just G mod H because G acts transitively on X with stabilizer H. Stabilizer is a closed subgroup, so this is a manifold, and we have this guy mapping to this guy bijectively by uh, by simply saying that if we take um, any linear transformation, uh, we map it to that linear transformation applied to this p-dimensional subspace, and that turns out to quotient doesn't depend on multiply on H on this side. So that enforces the Grassmannian, which was now, I was saying before, a moment ago, that was, we just treat as a set. That makes it into this manifold. Because it's a closed subgroup, we know this is, this is a, you know, that's an embedded, closed embedded submanifold. This is a sub, um, closed embedded subgroup. This is a manifold. And then this is a bijection. So we use the bijection to make this into a manifold, to make the Grassmannian into a manifold. So this is how we can tell that the Grassmannian is a manifold. And more generally, how we can tell that all these spaces that arise naturally as homogeneous under various Lie group actions are manifolds, because we don't have to work so hard, we don't have to construct any charts, we just have to know that the subgroup that fixes a point is closed, and then the quotient is automatically a smooth manifold, and this map is a, is a smooth diffeomorphism. So as, as an simple, another simple example, we can look at um, one of our favorites was SO3. Um, that could be our group. What are the possible homogeneous spaces? Well, we know some obvious ones. X is a point, is homogeneous. X is the two-dimensional sphere. It's rotated by the rotations. Um, X is RP2, which was, of course, the sphere modulo plus and minus the identity matrix, because um, that's just the set of lines through uh, 0 in R3, and of course is acted on by rotations in R3. Um, so those are some examples of homogeneous spaces. Um, we could also have uh, X is, in fact, all of SO3 acting on itself by either left or right translations, but we know that those are um, those are essentially the same transformation by taking a matrix to its inverse, you identify them. So those are some examples of homogeneous spaces. Um, now, uh, they and they give us quite a few uh, examples. We already found that um, that if we had a homogeneous space, well, if we had let's say if we had uh, we had any subgroup. Um, so what we want, one don't know, wonder know is what are our subgroups, and in particular, what are our closed subgroups? If we want to classify all the homogeneous spaces, we need to classify all the closed subgroups. Um, and we know that if we had a, if we had a closed subgroup, subgroup H containing SO3, we already worked out that its Lie algebra would have to be as zero or um, the span of uh, the real span of one vector e1 up to automorphism, um, where, where we're thinking of e1, e2, e3 as being the standard basis of R3, which we identify with SO3 with the, the cross product becoming the Lie bracket. Um, so that'll uh, mean that we can do this guy, and so we're thinking that our subgroup being rotation around this guy, and then. Um, and then we had all of SO3. So that means the identity component of our group has to be just the identity matrices, matrices or the rotations uh, around the, um, so the set of the rotations around uh, the E1 axis, uh, or uh, has to be, in this case, all of SO3. Um, so we still don't know what all the possibilities are, but we know what some possibilities of homogeneous spaces are, and we know what some possibi what possibilities are, at least for the identity component of this guy. Um, if we look at the, um, the, the associated homogeneous spaces, this guy on its own, if we take this to be H, would give us a homogeneous space, which is uh, quotient SO3 by the identity, get SO3, uh, quotient by the rotations around E1. Um, that's the stabilizer of E1 in the sphere, and so you get the sphere. So you, X is the sphere, and uh, of course here you take all of SO3, uh, and you get X as a point. So it does recover um, some of our of our examples. Um, there is, however, the difficulty of what what do we do if H is not connected? 
might have more than one component, so one could work a little bit harder and try to figure out what are those possibilities. For example, we already saw that x is rp2 uh, didn't, didn't, doesn't arise in this, uh, but it, it did arise as, as a homogeneous space. And of course, it's s2 modulo plus and minus 1. So we should think of it as being, as being somehow given by adding something else into here. And it's just uh, that we allow ourselves to, um, to rotate, but also to possibly to reflect. Um, we throw in to the uh, rotations around E1 the possibility of also reflecting, because the stabilizer of a line, the line through E1, uh, shouldn't just ro be rotating around the line. It should also be the possibility that you could reflect the line um, uh, to it to itself across this plane. So it's a, a group that contains this rotation group. This is this is a circle group, um, and this group contains that circle group, but also has has a plus and minus. So it's it's that circle group crossed with with that reflection, and so you can see a slightly larger H, um, which is uh, somehow uh, just um, a plus or minus one crossed with a with a, a circle group. So you can see that some of the disconnected possibilities. Um, of course, we have other possibilities with, with identity uh, here. We could construct things which are quotients. X is SO3. These are ones I didn't mention yet. Modulo some gamma, where gamma could be, for example, the rotation symmetries of a cube or an icosahedron. Um, and that would be some discrete group. So it might be a finite group. And if you take any such finite group, it's automatically closed. And so this quotient is actually a manifold. Um, so you get a lot of, of remarkable examples this way because you're constructing three-dimensional manifolds uh, with some interesting topology from the fact that you're quotienting by this, by this group. So that gives us some nice examples of computing out um, for a particular group, SO3, a very, very elementary group, computing out some of the possible homogeneous spaces by using our theorems here. So now we want another nice big theorem that enables us to see why do we care so much about homogeneous spaces. Um, we said that the real purpose of studying lead groups originally was the study of uh, their, how they arise in, for example, in mathematical physics or in other areas of symmetries, particularly of differential equations. So, um, but we could imagine any lead group G acting on any manifold M, and um, then we could pick a point M in M, and we could study its stabilizer of that point. The stabilizer of just that point, of course, is a closed subgroup. And so we could map G to M by G goes to GM. For that fixed point M, we pick that one particular point, and that will draw out the orbit. But, uh, but the map, you can see, is then going to be unchanged if you multiply by the stabilizer on this side. So um, if you put anything in the stabilizer, it'll fix M. So anything in the stabilizer is stuck in here, we'll give it G, GMM which is just dm, because the stabilizer doesn't move the point m. So that, again, becomes defined as a map, uh, well, sorry, as a map uh, g modulo gm goes to the orbit uh, gm contained in the manifold. So what we've done, and this, none of this is really so much part of the theorem, it's almost just notation. It just says that this is a, this is a map, um, and the theorem is that this is a diffeomorphism. In other words, that the orbits are homogeneous spaces. So that's a homogeneous space of the group, and that's uh, the orbit. So all the orbits are homogeneous spaces, uh, uh, and, and then orbits are immersed. The orb this is an immersion. It's an immersed submanifold. So the orbits are immersed submanifolds, and they di are diffeomorphic to homogeneous spaces. Okay, so let's see if we can prove the result. Um, we'll... Uh, consider, first of all, the obvious fact that this is a, we do have that this is a closed subgroup, and we do have that, therefore, this is a, is a smooth map. So, um, so all we need to do is check uh, that uh, g mod gm goes to the orbit. Uh, gm is uh, bijection. Okay, so that's easy enough, and I won't worry too much about that. Um, and then what we can do is to, to look at the, at the motion of a point. Um, so, um, so we want to take a look at, um, at our, let's say, our action is given by 
let's, let's suppose we define a map phi, which is going to be taking, um, uh, let's say, g in uh, g to uh, gm in gm in the orbit. And then, of course, we know that phi descends to a map on g mod gm goes to uh, gm. Yeah, it goes to us, or it goes to the g orbit. So let's just call that map phi. Um, and then we can differentiate uh, this expression here. Gives it, if you differentiate by along a one parameter subgroup, you get that phi prime at any g times the left invariant, for the right, sorry, the right invariant vector field, um, uh, you get to be the corresponding right on, on the group is, of course, the corresponding right invariant vector field on the, on the manifold. And so, um, so this is uh, therefore um, going to be um, uh, the, um, well, this is equal to zero if and only if um, the, uh, uh, the uh, if and only if, let's say, ddt at t equals zero e to the t a g m is zero, and then um, uh, which which is zero if and only if zero is d d t at t equals zero of g inverse e to the t a g m um, by just translating by an element g inverse. Um, so that's if and only if um, the um, I'll leave you to convince yourself. We do the, to, the, how to find the kernels of these things. That this is in uh, the Lie algebra of the stabilizer, um, and add G inverses into Lie algebra stabilizer. So that's saying, in other words, that A is in add G of the stabilizer. Um, so in particular, the um, the kernel has constant rank because this this subspace is always of the same dimension. The adjoint is in, is is moving it along to always be the same dimension. So the kernel of this phi has constant rank, and at point it's actually an, an immersion at uh, g equals the identity. Phi is an immersion. It's um, so so phi is an immersion everywhere. Everywhere. Okay, so that's how we can move it along and see that it's immersion everywhere. Okay, so um, so as a simple example of this kind of result, if you think about rotations acting on um, S O N plus one acts on R N plus one, um, and then the the um, the orbits are spheres, which are of course homogeneous spaces. Of the of that rotation group, so you have these spheres which are um, which are rotated around by the by the S O N plus one, and all the orbits are spheres. And then if you pick a one particular point, you pick some particular e, let's say e one um, unit vector in R N plus one, then the stabilizer is uh, S O N contained in S O N plus one. Okay. So it gives you um, uh, some uh, kind of uh, you know idea of what what we're thinking about. That if you're rotating around, creating these spheres, you have these stabilizers, right? Because the ones that the matrices that stable the rotation matrices that stabilize this vector have to have a one here and zeros here, and so they have zeros here, and then anything here, any rotation in here, and that's how this lower dimensional rotation sits inside the higher dimensional one. So to, to use this kind of machinery, we'd like to be able to understand how to relate more complicated Lie groups to simpler ones. And this uh, comes from a very straightforward theorem. So suppose that we have uh, N containing G closed as a subgroup, but also normal. Um, then uh, the quotient Q is defined to be G mod N is a, uh, is a Lie group. Uh, with G goes to Q, the quotient map being a, a Lie group morphism. Um, and uh, and then um, a smooth Lie group morphism. Um, so, and on the other hand, um, every Lie group morphism has closed, um, 
conversely, uh, conversely, uh, every um, Lie group morphism has a closed normal kernel. Um, so they all come about like that. And, and so in general, if you have some morphism, G to Q, um, and then you let the N be the kernel, um, then, um, and if this is on to, let's say, then, um, then of course, uh, G mod N is isomorphic to Q. So let's see why that works. So we'll try and give proof of that one. Um, we have, uh, we have some N, uh, so the proof is uh, N is contained G's closed normal, um, and therefore Q by our general theorem that when you quotient uh, is G mod N is uh, is a manifold, a smooth manifold, and the quotient map uh, is smooth, is a smooth submersion. Um, okay, so we've got that much. Um, so, uh, so what we can do uh, is locally we can uh, we can make that thing have some kind of a smooth section, because by the implicit function theorem we know that if we have a submersion, then at least locally um, we can. So here's Q, here's G, and then we have all these uh, fibers. Locally, we could pick something that cuts across the fibers, one fiber each, and lift this guy up to here. So, um, so uh, every uh, for all points Q nine Q, there exists some S, um, which takes uh, U Q to G. Let's say so U Q containing Q open, and uh, with this point Q not inside that open set. Um, uh, so striking uh, each uh, fiber once. So it's possible to somehow make a section. This is really just a local section. Um, so um, so that we get uh, S of Q. So this projection mapping here is just taking pi of G is G N. Um, so then what we're saying is S of Q, when you project it, you get back Q. Okay, so that's what mean being a section is. That's what this little picture is that produced this section, S. So we have a map down here. We know that because it's a submersion locally, we can make nice coordinates in which it's just a product mapping, so it has this, this section. Suppose we take two such sections, say S1 and S2, uh, two such. Um, now what we're going to do is to try to look at um, multiplying points. Uh, oh, sorry. No, I don't want two such. I want, what do I want to do? I want to um, consider just one such section, but I'll take, uh, I'll take, um, mm, sorry, yeah, two. Okay, two such. All right, S1, S2 around some points Q1, Q2. And then, um, then what I'll do is I'll take some point x uh, near x1 near q1 and x2 near q2. Um, and then I'll plug in my sections. I'll have um, that, um, let's say, then x1 times x2 down in, down in, downstairs in q is by this operation pi of s1 of x1. Uh, times, what do I want to do, um, uh, times, uh, no, I want to do pi of S1, S2 of X2. Uh, um, so it's S1 of X1 times normal subgroup, S2 of X2 times normal subgroup. Um, so I can, I can go downstairs and upstairs and I can relate the, the multiplication. Um, so that's smooth in x1 and x2 because uh, because these are smooth sections and then I'm multiplying smoothly upstairs and so the multiplication is smooth downstairs and so that makes sure that the that the quotient Lie group structure is actually smooth um, so multiplication is smooth 
smooth. So multiplication is smooth where it's defined. Okay, so that that'll work out at least where the local sections actually have some kind of overlapping behavior, right? So small uh, near, nearby points. I suppose I could have made them be just use just one section. I could have made points. And I think that's what I did in my notes. Just one single section, have them both be points near the same cube. Maybe that would be a simpler uh, way to explain the proof. So this makes it possible for us to to simplify the problem of understanding the structure of Lie groups because um, if we can find examples of normal subgroups, we can find quotients, and then uh, somehow it's easier to understand uh, a complicated group G in terms of its smaller normal subgroups and its smaller quotient groups. And so it gives a kind of, of approach to start trying to build more complicated ones out of simpler ones and to understand more complicated ones out of understanding simpler ones. Um, for example, um, if we looked at the um, uh, at the um, a general linear group over GLN K. Let's just for simplicity take K to be the quaternions. This is a very complicated group. Um, and what you could do is you could look at a normal subgroup uh, consisting of um, the set of all matrices lambda times identity such that I think I want to take lambda to be um, uh, in the real numbers non-zero. And that's uh, a, a subgroup of, let's say, G. Um, so it's a subgroup. And the, 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 the tricky thing is, of course, you have to check that it's normal. It's not terribly difficult to check that it's normal. Um, when you conjugate the identity, you get the identity, and the lambda just pulls out because it's a real scaling. Um, so it pulls out of any matrix multiplications. So it's not surprising this is a normal subgroup. And so there is a quotient group, which is traditionally called something like PSL uh, N. K is uh, defined to be uh, GL and K modulo uh, this group R cross so that uh, that exists um, it's possible to construct a quotient uh, and note that in fact this guy acts trivially on the Grismanian if you look at the Grismanian of p dimensional subspaces in some uh, K to vector space um, let's say so V here is going to be KN um, uh, the N group N acts trivially, and uh, so the quotient. Um, so in fact, we've been studying all this linear algebra acting on, on Grassmannians, but actually, as we recognize, the rescalings don't do anything, um, and the, the quaternions. These are the only things we could reasonably call rescalings that uh, that we want to work with as our normal subgroup. So in fact, the quotient group uh, uh, actually acts acts on the Grismanian um, because it's um, be because the the normal subgroup acts trivially and uh, and so the quotient group acts so we want to start thinking about um, a little bit about the topology of the Lie groups and the relationship of the, the their topology to the topology of the homogeneous spaces they act on um, so we think about covering maps um, uh, and Lie groups and um, so the the first um, basic uh, result, which is surprisingly easy to prove, is that every um, connected Lie group has, um, uh, let's say, G has pi one of G abelian. Um, what what is pi one of G? Remember, pi one is this homotopy group. You take loops, continuous or smooth loops. For us, it'll be the same because we can smooth them out. So, and you consider two such loops to be equivalent if it's possible to make a homotopy from one to the other, or continuously deform one loop to the other. Um, uh, so, how do we prove this? It's surprisingly, as I say, not, not too difficult. Um, we take uh, some loops. Um, so, proof is we have loops, some x of s uh, loop, and some y of t, uh, sorry, x of s, y of t loops, uh, so one of them is parameterized by a parameter t uh, as t goes along this way, the other one is parameterized by a parameter s as it goes along this way. Um, and then what we're going to do is simply define um, a map uh, on a square on the s and t square um, by, uh, so it's going to map the whole thing into the group, uh, simply by s t goes to uh, x of s y of t 
and if you go along this side and then this side, you go along x of s with y of t always at setting, at set to be 1. Let's suppose we start at the identity element of the group, so we're, our loops are in the group, and we start at the identity element of the group, so here's our group. Um, uh, sorry, it's not a great picture. Um, so, uh, so we start at the identity element of the group. We can assume the loops come out of whichever point we want, uh, so we can always pick it to be the identity element of our group. We'll go around one, this is the y one, this is the x one. Um, and so we get this little square. It fills in going first. If you go this way, you go along x, and then this way you go along y. But if you go this way, you go along, uh, along y, and then this one along x. And that means that the, um, that we can make a homotopy between, between going along x and then y, uh, going along this path, this path, and then this path, and then going along y and then x. So that makes a very explicit homotopy between the two. And that means going along x and then y is the same as going along y and then x in our homotopy group. As this lecture is already becoming um, quite heavy with proofs, and also since um, many of the students will not be all that familiar with covering space theory, um, I think we'll just skip the, the next proof, uh, just state the result. Proof's very, uh, very elegant, but uh, let's just allow ourselves to say uh, something about um, the result, which is uh, the following. If a, a Lie group G is connected, um, then its universal covering space, uh, I'll say what that is for those who don't remember that or who've never come across it. Um, Say I call it G uh, tilde uh, has a unique uh, Lie group structure. Uh, for which, which uh, uh, the universal covering map, universal covering map, g tilde to g, is a Lie group morphism. Okay, um, and a local diffeomorphism. Well, end of smooth covering map, let's say. It's not only um, covering map topologically, but also a smooth, um, smooth uh, map, uh, smooth local diffeomorphism. But what's really rather surprising, we'll see in examples how this looks, um, is that the fundamental group. which is a top purely topological entity, pi 1 of g, is actually embedded, this is what's strange, um, it's actually embedded into the universal covering group as the kernel. And this is what enables us to relate, uh, surprisingly, the, these, this Lie group to this topological gadget that's embedded as the kernel of um, the covering map, which is said is, is, is now a is now a group morphism, and is a discrete central subgroup. So it's discrete topologically and central as algebraically. That means central means it commutes with everything. It's in the center. It commutes with everything. So um, so this is rather surprising. Um, so what it tells tells you is that uh, you have this group. Now I should say again, what's what's the universal covering space? You have this Lie group here. We construct its covering universal covering space. That for for at least for the kinds of topological spaces we're dealing with, simply means that there is a covering space. So this G tilde over G. So each little point of each point of G has a little tiny open set, which is evenly covered. As we said before, it should be evenly covered by open sets upstairs. Um, that project down to it, like a little disk here, and then a whole stack of uh, of, of isometric disks here. So each 
um, open set, eight point here lies on an open set, which is evenly covered in the sense that the pre-image of that open set upstairs in G tilde is a collection of open sets, each of which is is homeomorphically mapped, in our case it's actually diffeomorphically mapped to this one, and they're all um, um, uh, they're they're all uh, uh, disjoint from one another's closures, so they're actually sort of separated apart from one another. So we get this kind of picture of a um, of what uh, what G looks like and what the map from G tilde looks like. So that's a, a covering map. Now there is a unique universal covering space, and that's the covering space which is simply connected. So what we're saying is not only that there is this that that G has a covering by this G tilde, but also that the one of G tilde is trivial, so that all the loops on G tilde contract. Um, so an example of a universal covering space, our favorite example is probably the sphere uh, covering a uh, real projective space. We know that's a universal covering space. It's, these aren't Lie groups, but this is a universal covering space because these are simply connected for n greater than or equal to 2. The 2 sphere covers the real projective plane, um, and the real projective plane has a non-trivial topology. It's a non-trivial fundamental group and has loops that don't contract, and loops on the two-sphere contract. Um, so that's a nice example of a, of a universal covering space. What we're declaring is that if we have a Lie group, we can construct its universal covering space, which we know from topology always exists, and we know from previous experience in this class uh, as always a smooth manifold. This is always a smooth local diffeomorphism. But in fact, what's better is it can be turned into a Lie group morphism, and the kernel actually allows you to see the fundamental group. So let's just work on some examples of that um, to see what comes out um, as, uh, as the picture of, of how we find these fundamental groups. Um, so, um, so for example, we could look at uh, something like um, uh, the unit quaternions. We said that um, given a unit quaternion, so the three sphere sits inside, we think of R4 as the as the quaternions, and the unit quaternions sit inside there, so that's a unit quaternion. And we said that it could act on any um, on any on the imaginary quaternion. The imaginary quaternions are R3, the ones with zero real part. Um, and we could make Q uh, act on X by um, by a rotation, rotating uh, Q acts on X by Q, X, Q inverse. And that rotation action then takes the three sphere to the rotations of three dimensional space because this X is in three dimensional space. This is rotating it, and that's a map like this. And we've actually found that this map was a two to one map. So we have S3, somehow this simply connected S3 mapping to this guy, which is, we previously said was in fact RP3. And the reason it was RP3 is actually it was the quotient of this guy by plus and minus one. So what we have is, um, is a covering map, in fact universal, because the three sphere is simply connected. Um, it's a covering map uh, of S3 to SO3. And the kernel of the covering map consists of the, the, the quaternions uh, Q is plus or minus one. The quaternion are the ones for which this uh, the rotation is is trivial. If you make Q equal to minus one, you get a minus one on this side. You get a minus one on that side. They cancel each other out in pairs, and so it disappears. Um, so we've got a a picture of unit quaternions mapping to rotation matrices, and the kernel is exactly the plus and minus one unit quaternions. Um, now, what we've said, though, was that the fundamental group should act, of this guy should actually be the kernel of this map. The kernel is plus and minus 1, so this is the fundamental group of SO3 should be exactly uh, the group of elements plus and minus 1. And that's correct because it was RP3, and we know that RP3 has this weird behavior that you can go around it um, once with a, with a loop that doesn't contract, and then we go twice around the same loop, then it does contract. Um, so that's uh, our our uh, serious example of of, of using um, this this theorem to actually see how to calculate a fundamental group. Or another from another point of view, you could really say that you're seeing um, how to uh, how to realize the the 
RP3 as this sort of quotient uh, by this group action. We, we had a similar example um, that worked in four dimensions instead of three dimensions, which was that we could take uh, two quaternions, say Q and R, um, so each of them is a quaternion, and um, in the unit quaternions, again, unit quaternions are a group, um, so a Lie group. So what we could do is we could take them and we could then take any uh, uh, quaternion, so that's R4, and we could give rise to a rotation of that quaternion depending on the Q and R. We rotate quaternion X by QX R inverse, and that's a, a group morphism between um, rho takes Q and R in S3 cross S3 to this operation, rho of QR is going to eat X and spit this out, and it's not hard to convince yourself. It's actually a, um, a, a rotation because its norm is, is, is 1. The, the norm is preserved. The um, quaternions of norm 1 um, preserve the norm of things they multiply by. So then um, so it's not hard to convince yourself, as we did, that this is actually is a rotation of four-dimensional space. So that, we said before, was a map from S3 cross S3 to SO4, and now each of the three spheres is simply connected. So this is a nice example of um, a map that is going to um, to realize SO4 as being S3 cross S3 modulo plus and minus 1, the kernel of this morphism of groups. If you check out what's the kernel of rho, it's a morphism of groups from this group to this group, and you can check out that it's its, its kernel is plus or minus 1. Again, uh, sorry, sorry, it's, um, uh, it's uh, uh, 1, 1, and minus 1, minus 1 uh, are the kernel sitting inside there. So this guy is a quotient. So that's the kernel sitting inside here, and then it's quotiented down to produce SO4. And so we get the topology. Uh, we get some topology. We get the fundamental group of SO4 uh, is uh, exactly the, the group consisting of these two. So it's just plus or minus the one as an abstract group. Um, so that gives us a, a, a topological piece of topological information about this, about this Lie group.